So first of all, a few words about Savitri Bhavan itself, how it has come into existence. Ranaji, who is here, will be remembering the very beginnings of Savitri. He was one of the people who belonged to the first group that was formed in November 1994 for study of Savitri in Auroville. Because we all have a great reverence for Sri Aurobindo's poem, Savitri was being read in different places in Auroville by individuals and groups. But there was this proposal that we should form a study group. And that was started from November 24, 1994. And when that group had been running for a little time, for a few months, among the members there came the suggestion that we can't just meet here and there as rooms are available. There should be a place which is devoted specifically to the study of Savitri to gathering all kinds of materials that will help us to understand and appreciate Sri Aurobindo's poem better. And we can invite speakers, scholars, who can enlighten us and help us to understand better. So there was a surprisingly rapid response in Auroville, and within a few months we were granted this plot of land and uh, with the approval of Auroville's chief architect. And we started uh, uh, planting things in the garden. But it, the, the first permanent building was uh, opened by our beloved elder brother, Nirod Baran, only in 1999, 8th of August, 1999. So we're coming up to our uh, 20 years now. And now, just in the last few months, the whole complex, as it was dreamed of and designed in 1994 to 1995, has now been physically completed. And we take this as the great uh, grace and blessings of Mother and Sri Aurobindo. On the day when Nirod Baran laid the foundation stone round about here, um, he invoked the presence and the blessings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And we felt immediately that, they, that their presence came, and we felt that presence supporting us ever since. So why is it important to study Sri Aurobindo's Savitri here in Auroville. It's important because the mother has told us that this poem is the supreme revelation of Sri Aurobindo's vision. And since our dream city, her dream city, Auroville, has been created to realize the vision of Sri Aurobindo, it's very important that we should know what that vision is. We should at least try to understand it. So we've been meeting regularly, not in, this room is relatively new, but we've been meeting at Savitri Bhavan regularly uh, since 1994, when there was no building we used to sit under the trees, when we had the first small building we used to meet there. Since uh, last January, we are meeting here. We read. We've been reading continuously. I don't think we have missed any Sunday morning since November 24th, 1994. About this many people gather, perhaps a few more, on Sunday mornings, 10.30 to 12. We take turns in reading the passage. 
when one of the members has read. Uh, we take time to silently reread and try to understand what has been read. And then we take time for sharing any insights, any questions mm. that have come about the poem. Mm. And we start at the beginning and we go to the end and then we start at the beginning again. I'm not sure how many times we have passed all the way through. Perhaps now we are on the seventh reading, maybe. I, I haven't kept a record. So why, why, what are we absorbing with this? In a letter of 1948, Sri Aurobindo has mentioned to his dear um, disciple, Amal Kiran, who had been typing the text at an earlier stage, several years previously, he told him, now Savitri has become something quite different from what it was when you were typing those texts. Now it has become a kind of revelation of my philosophy of life, my world view. Hmm? So that is what we can find in Savitri. The very first uh, the text of Savitri that we have, it's in the uh, Sri Aurobindo archives, dates from 16th of October uh, 20, uh, 1916. And it's a text, continuous text, of about 2,000 words. And the whole story of Savitri is there, everything that is in, almost everything that is in this poem but just 2,000 words. Now we have 24,000 lines. <laughs> and uh, Sri Aurobindo has added to it, refined it, improved it over and over and over again in the course of um, almost, well, 35 years at least that we know of. You must all be familiar with the story, the traditional story of Savitri. No? Why has Sri Aurobindo taken this particular story? He's written long narrative poems about other stories from Mahabharata, from the Puranas and so on. Um, but why, why has he taken this story and why was it so important for him? What, what was the significance that he saw in it? So he has given us a clue in his author's note to the poem. I'll read this to you. The tale of Satyavan and Savitri is recited in the Mahabharata as a story of conjugal love conquering death. That's the traditional story. That's how we remember it. That is how it is celebrated in many families still today on the, uh, the traditional day that's remembered as the day when Satyavan must die. Um, the ladies uh, don't take food or water for a whole 24 hours or longer, and they pray, they make offerings, wishing for the welfare of their husbands. No? That is how we remember the traditional story. Sri Aurobindo sees in it a deeper significance. He says, this legend is as shown by many features of the human tale, one of the many symbolic myths of the Vedic cycle. It's not just in Mahabharata 
its history is much longer. And in the, in the Vedas, Sri Aurobindo has discerned a psychological symbolism, very different from the surface meanings that we usually draw. So it's that symbolic significance that he saw in this story, one of the many symbolic myths of the Vedic cycle. He refers to the names of the characters. First, Satyavan. Satyavan is the soul carrying the divine truth of being within itself, but descended into the grip of death and ignorance. All of us are carrying that divine soul in us. And in each of us, that divine soul has accepted, has agreed to come down and inhabit an imperfect mortal body here in the world of time and space and separation in order to participate in a great adventure. Shobindo shows us something of that adventure for which our souls have agreed to descend. <laughs> to descend into the grip of ignorance and death. The soul is carrying the truth of being within itself but it's accepted to come and inhabit an imperfect human body which will die, which has to die, and where the knowledge is only partial, not full, ignorance. Hmm? Savitri is the divine word daughter of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth, who comes down and is born to save. The supreme divine mother herself accepts to come down into the world wearing the outer form of a human being in order to save all the many souls who are struggling in the grip of ignorance and death. Aswapati, his name means the Lord of the Horse. And the horse in the Vedic symboli symbolism is energy. Usually it's our life energy, but sometimes it can be even universal energy. Aswapati, he will become the human father of Savitri. Sri Aurobindo says that what he represents in the symbolism of the story is he's the lord of tapasya. He has drawn together and controlled all his energies to fulfill a great dream which he has. He's the lord of tapasya the concentrated energy of spiritual endeavor that helps us human beings to rise from our mortal state to the immortal planes. In order to become more than human, we have to concentrate our energies, link them with higher energies, and rise to the immortal planes, which are not subject to ignorance and death. That's the significance in the story of King Aswapati. Satyavan's father is called Dhyumatsena. Sri Aurobindo uh, translates this as Lord of the Shining Host the shining armies, the armies of light. Hmm? 
he is or he represents the divine mind. Here in our world, that divine mind of perfect knowledge and will has become blind. In the story, um, Satyavan's father has become blind. And because he's become blind, his enemies have taken over, he's lost his kingdom, he's had to go into exile. No? So he says, uh, Duma Sena is the divine mind. Here in our world, fallen blind, losing its celestial kingdom of vision, and through that loss, its kingdom of glory. This is the symbolic significance of, that Sri Aurobindo puts into this story. But he says, still, this isn't a mere allegory. The characters are not personified qualities. They are incarnations or emanations of living and conscious forces with whom we can enter into concrete touch. And they take human bodies in order to help man and show him the way from his mortal state to a divine consciousness and an immortal life. Would anybody like to ask anything about this uh, author's note that's here? So you know the traditional story. It also begins with Aswapati, no? that he, he wants children, and in order to gain heirs, he wants to have a hundred strong sons uh, like himself, to rule the kingdom properly for the welfare of the people. You know? uh, he worships this Divine Mother, Savitri. We know this word name, Savitri, has two significances. One is as the daughter of the sun. And we have these different significances of different names of the sun for different times of day. I was very thrilled when a Sanskritist told me that this name Savitri, it is the name for the sun just before it rises above the horizon. So the new light that's coming, the promise of new light, new consciousness, new illumination. The other significance we attach to this name Savitri is as one of the Shaktis of Lord Brahma. He has two wives, Savitri and Gayatri. Maybe they are the same, two names for the same force. The Shakti of the Creator, of the Lord who has manifested all this universe through her. She is the conscious force, and she is the truth. She's, that's what truth is, this will of the Lord expressed as a conscious force at work in the world. So this is a, a beautiful significance to think of, this power of savitri. The, the Divine Word, Daughter of the Sun, Goddess of the Supreme Truth. That is the being, the light, that King Asvapati worships. For 18 years, it says in the traditional story. And only then, after 18 years. 18 must also be a symbolic number. No, it, it must mean something. Uh, if we look in Savitri, we can think 
that it maybe corresponds to different stages of King Aswapati's yoga. But finally, um, he is able to meet the Supreme Mother face to face. In the course of his tapasya, his sadhana, he's conceived, the, he's become aware of the possibility that the life here on earth doesn't need to be always the way it is now. That it can become, it could become a divine life without suffering, without ignorance, without darkness, without falsehood and evil of any kind. And he's determined that he will do everything possible to make that happen. That's how Sri Aurobindo tells the story, how Aswapati sets out on his quest to find that power and principle that will make life on earth into a divine life. So he becomes the traveler of the worlds. We see him traveling through all the planes of existence, starting from matter, then the kingdom of subtle matter, then the different levels of life. There are um, seven cantos about different levels of life. Then uh, several cantos about different levels of mind. And finally he reaches a plane which uh, Sri Aurobindo calls the self of mind. Professor Arabinda Basu from the ashram gave us a very beautiful talk about this self of mind. He says it means meeting the universal self, the one, on the plane of mind. The, those who have had this experience they found it such a wonderful liberation. Aswapati also finds it so liberating, this vastness. But, uh, well, usually people who reach that stage, they think they have reached the goal, that this is moksha, no? and that they don't need to go any further. But Aswapati is not looking for moksha. He's not looking for uh, liberation for himself. He's looking for transformation for the whole world. So he's not satisfied with this peace and this vastness and this silence. It even begins to seem to him like a kind of prison from which the only escape would be for him to cease to exist. And he's not going to do that. He doesn't want to do that. So in answer to his intense aspiration, he receives an invitation. It's as if somebody or something is beckoning to him, calling to him to go into a much deeper plane. And he's able to enter into the world of soul. It's a beautiful canto where he explores this world of soul. One of the things he sees there is the place where our souls rest between one birth and another. We're in a kind of sleep and in that sleep we assimilate, we digest all the past experiences and our soul decides what it wants to do next, what will be its best way of progressing in the next life. And so Aswapati sees all that happening. But then when he moves on further, for the first time he gets a glimpse of the Supreme Divine Mother who rules that world of soul. He just gets a little glimpse of her. She's veiled 
but for a moment she removes or she puts aside her veil, he sees her face, he's absolutely overwhelmed with bliss, and he knows this is the power that can bring about this great transformation. He surrenders to her completely. He goes into a kind of trance, and when he wakens from that trance, he finds himself in another level of higher knowledge, greater knowledge, above and beyond the mind. It's the last canto of uh, Book Two. There he's really on the very edge of almost supermind. And uh, in the poem, Sri Aurobindo says, he takes hold of the reins of cosmic force. He's no longer controlling just his own individual horses. He's able to uh, be connected with the will of the universal forces. But he still hasn't found what he was looking for. He has the feeling that there's something, another higher truth, which is not yet grasped. Uh, he's in love with that truth, but he can't get hold of it. It's the first canto of Book Three, In Search of the Unknowable. And he even has an experience of the unknowable. Great yogis have this experience of the vastness, the oneness, it's unknowable to the mind, but it can be experienced somehow by the part of us that comes from the unknowable. He has this union. But then it's as if the mother is telling him, you've made a great achievement, but this is not the end. No. Now you're free, you're fully free, but there's still something more that the Supreme Lord doesn't want us just to be free of, of the world. He wants the world to be changed. God wants to express himself perfectly without any limitations in the world, in the material world. She gives him that knowledge, and then she appears to him. It's as if she's embracing him with her being. So we have this beautiful uh, chapter, Adoration of the Divine Mother. It's when then that he realizes that she is the only power that can bring about the transformation that he needs. But then he finds himself stuck somehow, he, as if he can't go any further. Hmm? He sees all the imperfection in himself, how this has to be transformed. And Sri Aurobindo gives a very, very striking image. He says, he pulled desire out like a tooth, you know, pulling out a tooth by its roots. And he offered to the gods, to the cosmic powers, the vacant place. And when he does that, something in him is transformed. And it seems, uh, what I can understand about this state that he comes into. This is the state which Sri Krishna refers to in the Gita, the Purushottama state. Hmm? I won't go into too much details about that now, but we, we could discuss it in more detail. That's a kind of last transformation for him. And when that has happened, then he's able to meet the mother face to face. But straight away she tells him, I know what you want, and you can't have it. <laughs> she says, the earth is not ready. Human beings are not ready 
for this divine life for everybody that you are asking for, that you want. She tells him at length about the imperfections of humanity and all that has to change. She says, be patient. It will all come about in God's good time. But he can't be patient. He says, Mother, how can I be patient now I've seen you? How can I just go back to being an ordinary human being? Hmm? Please, I know that your creation can't fail, that this perfection will come about, but it's all taking such a long time. Won't you incarnate yourself and send an emanation of yourself down to help us? And she says, yes, I will. So that emanation is born as Aswapati's daughter, Savitri. So that's the end of the first part of um, the poem. The second part tells about the, the birth and growing up of Savitri and then how her father sends her out to find the, her life's partner, her quest, beautiful description of what ancient India must have been like. Hmm. And finally she comes up into the mountains, she still uh, hasn't found the one she's looking for, but there on the edge of the forest, suddenly she sees a young man standing. And Sri Aurobindo gives us some suspense. He says she would have gone on. You know? Only her soul woke her up and made her stop, stop the chariot and Savitri and Satyavan meet. And there's a beautiful short book, The Book of Love. But uh, you may like to have a look at the end of Canto 2 of that book. Sri has given such a beautiful description of what love really is, the love between human beings. So beautiful. And for me, it's very, very interesting. I did a study that from that original version of uh, 1916, which parts have remained in the final version? So there's a few a sentence or two in book three, in part one, in book three. But here at the end of um, Canto two of book five, um, there's a long passage which is, comes from the first version. And then there's another long passage in book 11, uh, which comes from the very first version. So we can sh see that Sri Aurobindo had the whole course of the poem in his head from the beginning, but it was as if it went on growing and growing and expressing itself in more and more detail and clarity over those years that he worked on it. So there they have met, Savitri and Satyavan, and they've agreed to marry, and Savitri says, I have to go back and tell my father he'll be so happy. No. So then we come to book six. This is something that Sri Aurobindo has added to the story. When, um, of course, the, the, the bit about Narad is there in the original legend. When Savitri reaches her father's palace, Narad is there, this semi-divine being who can move between heaven and earth, who can see the past and the present and the future. So they ask him to bless the marriage, and he doesn't. He hesitates. So Sri Aurobindo has added here a character who isn't in the original story, uh, Savitri's mother. It is Savitri's mother who gets very alarmed and says, Narad, if there's anything wrong with this boy or his family, please tell us now, don't let us make a mistake. 
So Narad says that in every way Satyavan is perfectly qualified to be the mate of Savitri. But very unfortunately, its destiny has decreed that he will die 12 months from now, from this date. So then, of course, the Savitri's mother especially is so unhappy and says, no, you will have to go and look again. And Savitri refuses. She says, I know who I've chosen. I've seen God look at me in Satyavan. I can't change my mind now. Whatever will happen, will happen if we are just together for a year, just for a year. But I know that I'm not born just for that. So let us see. And then they can't refuse her. But this is where Sri Aurobindo has inserted Savitri's mother um, questions Narad. She said, how can things go, go wrong like this in our world? How has your God made it like this? Why is it like this? So there's quite a long canto in which Sri Aurobindo gives his answer <coughs> or his reassurances to us about the problems of pain. And for us human beings, uh, Narad says, you bear your life, go on every day as if it's a pilgrimage. When you're on a pilgrimage, you have to face difficulties. No? Go on, go on. Surely at the end, you will find your way to bliss, to ananda. No? And to Savitri's parents, he says, Savitri's carrying within her a great power she can take care of herself, she can take care of all of us. So don't oppose her anymore, we will see what happens. So they have to give their consent, and Narad goes off back to Vaikuntha, and uh, we move on to the next part of the poem, which is uh, Savitri's Yoga, Book 7, it's the Book of Yoga. Am I taking too much time? <laughs> Her yoga starts with great distress, as it does for many people. Something happens which she can't bear. No? When she first uh, starts to live with Satyavan and his parents in the forest, she's just so happy to be with him. But then, as the weeks and months pass and the rainy season comes, she thinks of just 12 months. It's passing, it's passing. And the pain grows so much in her that she loves him so much, but she's going to lose him so soon. And what to do? She's really suffering. So as the rainy season comes towards its end, one night she's sitting awake next to him. She, she doesn't want to give any sign of distress to him or to the family. <laughs> no. But she's, suddenly a voice from above comes to her and says, Savitri, why are you sitting like this, just repressing this load of gr grief in you? You've come to earth to do a great thing for humanity. So, you have to remember why you came, and then you will be able to contain my force, and you will be able to overcome the power of death. So Savitri undertakes the, the search for her soul. And that's described in several cantos. She, she's told, you're doing this not just for yourself, but for humanity. So you have to look inside your material body, your physical body, 
and see the subtle layers that are there. And right at the center, you will find your soul. So those different layers that are described, the subtle physical, subconscious, very ugly, the life, the lower life impulses, very powerful, but also ugly. You know? And then uh, higher levels of my life, which are somehow controlled by reason, but then they've lost a lot of their power because they are under control. And finally, she comes to a mind world and there the people think they've really found the truth and they are so satisfied with themselves. And they say, lucky one, you can join us. No? This is where you can stay. But she knows that she hasn't yet found her soul. She meets or she becomes aware of some beings coming from the soul world to our world, wanting to help us. And she, for a minute, she wants to join them. But then she th knows she has to find her soul first. So she asks them, she says, please tell me which way do I have to follow to find my soul? And they point out to her a path. She sets out on that path. And before she finds her soul, she becomes aware of three emanations of the soul. One is the Divine Mother of pity and compassion. She's supporting us in all our difficulties and sufferings. But she says, God gave me love. He didn't give me the power to save. Hmm? This is the first Madonna that she encounters. And she becomes aware that the, there's a kind of mirror image of this Madonna in the lower human world, which is the source of all um, cruelty and meanness and uh, brutality, you know, resentment, jealousy, all those terrible lower things. So the power of that mother is not enough. She moves on to another higher level and there she meets the mother of might. She's like Kali, she's like Durga, so powerful and brilliant and shining. And she says, I'm, I'm going to save the world if man will agree to be saved. But she says, but men are not agreeing to be saved. Well, they won't let me save them. <laughs> and likewise, Savitri sees a counterpart of that beautiful mother there's an ugly, self-centered, selfish part in human beings which refuses to be saved. And then she goes further and she meets the Mother of Light. She could really help, but again, we don't receive her. So Savitri tells that Mother of Light you know, you can pour down all kinds of light on human beings. They will just think it's their own cleverness. Mm. So what you have to do is to make human beings feel the urge, the longing for higher things, for infinity and eternity. And when I come back to Earth with Satyavan, um, then you will all be free, you three Madonnas, and you will find your right places. And those ugly lower beings, they will get dissolved also. She makes her promise. So in the next canto, it's the finding of the soul. Savitri really finds her soul. Also very beautiful description of how she comes to a kind of temple, very silent, beautiful, carvings on the wall. And there, it's as if there's a, a wall she has to pass through. It's a wall of flame, of living flame. When she passes through that, there suddenly is her true 
inner being. And these two, the human, little human soul, no bigger than the thumb of a man, lodged in our hearts to help us. And the original soul above, they fuse and join. And Savitri finds herself back on earth in the little hut beside Satyavan. But with her whole being, she's remembered her soul and she's calling to that mother to come down and inhabit her physical self. And that happens when the mother's presence comes down. Then uh, Savitri experiences uh, that when her feet touch the heart center, then the Kundalini power is awakened. This flaming serpent rises up and it opens each of the chakras one by one. So this is, we can say this represents the psychic realization and the psychic transformation. In Sri Aurobindo's yoga, there are, to make, for it to be complete, there are three um, realizations and corresponding transformations. There's the psychic, then the spiritual, and finally, when both of those have come, there's the supramental. So, this is um, Savitri's finding of the soul. She's very happy. She's no longer worried about Satyavan. She sees him in her vision, living a long life, them living a long and happy life together. But one night, when she's enjoying this happiness, it's suddenly as if there's a black cloud swallowing up the whole universe and uh, destroying. It says it's left her inner world laid waste. Everything is wiped out and destroyed. Terrible. And then again that higher voice comes to her and says, this psychic discovery that you've made, you have to keep it secret and quiet to yourself. And you are not here just for this wonderful psychic experience. You've come here to do more than that for humanity. And in order to be able to do your task for humanity, you're going to have to make another stage you're going to have to lose your ego completely. And it tells her the steps that she must do for that. So silencing the mind. So that is described in Canto 6. She reaches a stage where she sees that she could just go out of existence, but something is wanting her to remain. This is in the end of Canto 6 and beginning of Canto 7. And then a further step comes where everything that was silent and unreal and waiting is woken up to the experience of the cosmic spirit and the cosmic consciousness. And Savitri finds herself united with the whole universe Everything is within her, and she's within everything else. So this is the preparation for her to face the death of Satyavan. And it comes in the very next page, you know, that um, the book of death starts. She knows it's the day. Nobody else knows. And she wakes up in the morning. She says a prayer. She does her household chores first. Then she says her prayer. And then she goes to Satyavan's mother and asks him, I've been with you now a whole year, and I never went into the forest with Satyavan. Please let me go with him today. And of course she says yes. 
So the two of them go off into the forest. Satyavan, so happy to have Savitri with him, takes her by the hand. He's showing her all the plants and flowers and birds and trees that he loves. But she's just listening. She knows that death is going to come. So he, his work is to get some wood to take home for the, the fires at home, the fire of the altar and the fire of the kitchen. So he starts to, to cut at a tree, but as he's, and he's singing so joyfully, but as he's working, as he's singing, suddenly intense pain, and he realizes that this is uh, now the end for him. He says, Savitri, take me in your lap. Perhaps because you are touching me, then death will pass away. But he doesn't. And Savitri becomes aware that this figure of death is there. Here, Sri Aurobindo, the, this uh, book of death, he wrote very early on, 2016 or 2020s. But at the end, he added 18 lines, which describe that god of death. So that's, that's a very interesting new development, which connects this god of death, as he is in the legend, uh, to Sri Aurobindo's view of what this power represents in our, uh, our cosmos, our universe. Uh, universe. But because of this great, great preparation that she's made and all the knowledge that she's gained through her yoga, when death takes Satyavan's soul out of his body and takes him away, she's able to follow. And we see her following through a, a realm of terrible darkness, when she feels completely separated from everything, from Satyavan, from her own self, completely terribly painful part, the passage through the eternal night. But she doesn't give in. The light of her soul stays with her, goes on guiding, goes on following death as he leads Satyavan away. And they come out of that realm of complete darkness into a realm of twilight. It's beautiful. It's like a, a dawn. It's one of the most beautiful cantos in the poem. Hmm? And, uh, but that's the, the dream twilight of the ideal. All the beautiful dreams and ideas that we have. There she moves through them. But they are just dreams. <laughs> she tells death, let's move on from here. I'm not worshipping these dreams of yours. I'm worshipping God, the fire, the energy, the power. So lead us on. So oh, he leads her to the dream twilight of the earthly real. It's a kind of symbolic representation of our earth, how it is, what, how we experience it. And there there's, comes this very important book of the debate of love and death. Mother has uh, translated this book 10, a lot of it. All this discussion between death and Savitri. She tells him, look, death, you are giving, you're speaking truth. It's a kind of truth. But it's a truth that destroys, that slays. What I'm telling you, what I'm offering you, is the truth that saves. So we will see in, when we read this part that what death is saying is what we all believe and think. It's absolutely familiar to us. We think like that. And Savitri is offering us another way of looking at it. Quite different. 
full of light and hope and promise. Mm. So finally, um, death challenges her. He says, if, if you're being supported by the Divine Mother, then show her to me. Let me see her face. And then the, the Divine Mother comes down and inhabits Savitri. And it's not Savitri who speaks, it's the Mother. She says, yes, Death, you are my servant and you can serve me a bit longer, but for now, step aside. Set free this soul of the world called Satyavan. And so Savitri and Satyavan are left there Every, all these symbol worlds, they just dissolve. They're left there standing. But it's as if there's an invisible wall between them. That's how book 10 ends. And then we come to book 11, the book of the everlasting day. Beautiful description of all the higher realms of existence. But there too, she discovers the divine being. He's the divine. He's beautiful. He's adorable. He's carrying within him the four different aspects. The aspects of uh, Virat, Hiranyagaba, Prajna, Turiya. But he's still telling her, it's not possible. You can't take Satyavan back. She has to argue with him also at great length until finally he admits. He says, yes, you have the power. You can decide. But not here, not in these symbol worlds that make up the universe. We have to go beyond the universe into the transcendent. And from there you see how things are and then you decide. So she finds herself in this new realm and there's a voice that's offering her, first of all, perfect peace. Then, uh, well, I should find the place and read them. First of all, peace, the nameless, formless peace where all things rest. An immense extinction in eternity. But Savitri replies, give me your peace, O Lord, within a boon within to keep, amid the roar and ruin of wild time, for the magnificent soul of man on earth. Give us your calm, the calm that can bear the touch of your joy. And then the second time, he says, he offers her a formlessness, liberation, an immense and world-destroying pause. Every, all this you can leave it all behind. But she says, give me your oneness, Lord, in many approaching hearts, my sweet infinity of numberless souls. So the first is peace, oneness, and then power. My power, but stilled, my power inactive. Mm -hmm. And she says, give me thy energy, Lord, to seize on woman and man, to take all things and creatures in their grief and gather them into a mother's arms. And then he offers her again bliss, 
but she refuses that. She says, thy embrace, I shouldn't say she refuses, she accepts, but she doesn't accept for herself. She says, give it to me for human beings. Give me thy embrace, which rends the living knot of pain. Thy joy, O Lord, in which all creatures breathe thy magic flowing waters of deep love, thy sweetness give to me for earth and men. So that is the prayer of Aspapati, for earth and men. That's the prayer of Savitri, for earth and men. It's not for any of us as individuals, it's for the whole world. And the Supreme Lord agrees. Hmm? He tells her, Thy thoughts are mine. I have spoken with thy voice. My will is thine. What thou hast chosen, I choose. All thou hast asked, I give to earth and men. All shall be written out in destiny's book by my trustee of thought and plan and act, the executor of my will, eternal time. So he grants her everything. And then there's a long passage where he describes to her what this will mean for her individually, as an individual. I believe what he's telling is a description of the supramental state. And then, uh, he, after that, he gives her an, a long description of what it will mean for the earth in time. You know, until finally, um, the earthly life becomes the life divine. Hmm. And then Savitri can return to earth. There's a beautiful description of her uh, descending, being accepted back into the earth atmosphere. And then finally we come to book 12. It's called The Return to Earth. She wakes up she in her body, lying on the, on the ground where she's left it, when she left her body to follow Satyavan. And he's lying with his head on her breast. And uh, she wakes him up. Vaguely he remembers something. He says, what has been happening? <laughs> and she tells him, nothing has changed. But we've... Uh, We've been sent back to earth to give joy to all. But now we have to go home. Your parents will be worrying, she says. And so it's afternoon. They turn back towards the hermitage. And on the way, when they, as they're going, uh, they hear voices, horses, people, big company. There's a whole huge search party coming looking for them. And at the head of it, there is Dumatsena. He's not blind anymore. He's uh, perfectly okay. And um, following with him are all his followers and courtiers because he's been given back the kingdom. He's been asked to become the ruler once more. And there is Satyavan's mother. And uh, she's so delighted <laughs> to embrace uh, the two of them. And then Dumatsena asks Satyavan, um, what's been going on? Why are you so late? No? <laughs> and uh, Satyavan says, blame Savitri. It's all her thing. Uh, if it weren't for her, her, I wouldn't be still with you here on the earth. Mm. So then out of that party, there's one who seems like a priest and sage he asks her, he says, what light, what power revealed, 
working the rapid marvels of this day, opens for us by thee a happier age. And then what is Savitri's reply? Awakened to the meaning of my heart, that to feel love and oneness is to live, and this, the magic of our golden change, is all the truth I know or seek, O sage." They don't understand what she means, and perhaps we find it difficult to understand what she means. But anyway, then they return. There's a huge procession going back to the capital city, and uh, Satyavan and Savitri are there holding hands, and there's people chanting a marriage hymn. And night falls. There's a beautiful description of night. Splendid, with the moon dreaming in heaven, in silver peace, possessed her luminous reign. She brooded through her stillness on a thought deep guarded by her mystic folds of light, and in her bosom nursed a greater dawn." So the poem begins with dawn, the symbol dawn. That symbol dawn is full of darkness and resistance and refusal. We pass through the whole day. It all happens in one day. The next dawn is full of light, full of promise of a new age, a new way of life. Thanks to Sri Aurobindo. <laughs>